Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miss Elizabeth Christian, president of the Lyndon Baines Johnson Foundation. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Lyndon Baines Johnson Foundation, I welcome you to the second day of the Vietnam War Summit. Controversy and debate is critical to the success of this summit. Last night, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger said on this stage, in a statement that's bound to generate serious discussion, that he does not blame U.S. policy for the quagmire and stalemate of the Vietnam War. Instead, he believes the massive split in public opinion about the war was what ultimately caused the conflict to end the way that it did. Today, we're going to explore the roots of that split, hearing from people who were uniquely involved in both widening the gap and in reporting it in the media. In our second session this afternoon, two legendary journalists will discuss the influence the media had in shaping our perceptions of the Vietnam War as it played out in newspapers, magazines, on the radio, and in evening news broadcasts. This unparalleled coverage brought the war's brutal reality and its ever-rising casualty numbers into our living rooms every night. Our third session this afternoon will feature two renowned photographers who will share their Pulitzer Prize winning work documenting the war. They'll talk about how photography affected the way Americans literally saw Vietnam. But now for our first panel. We'll take a look at the divisions the war created throughout our country as the anti-war movement grew and support for the war eroded. It is my pleasure to introduce the participants and moderator for our first panel, The War at Home. Tom Hayden served 18 years in the California legislature and is the author of 20 books and many articles. He has spent more than 50 years in social movements, beginning with the Freedom Rides of 1960. He was the founder of SDS, Students for a Democratic Society. He was a community organizer in Newark and was a controversial, vocal, and high-profile leader of the anti-war movement. Mr. Hayden has lectured and taught at Harvard's Institute of Politics, UCLA Labor Studies, and Scripps, Occidental, and Pitzer Colleges. David Marinus is an acclaimed journalist and associate editor at the Washington Post. He is author of six best-selling and award-winning books, including They Marched Into Sunlight, about the Vietnam War's Battle of Ong Tan and an anti-war protest at the University of Wisconsin. David Marinus won the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting in 1993 and has been nominated for the Pulitzer on three other occasions. Marilyn Young is a professor of history at New York University, where she teaches courses on the history of U.S. foreign policy, the politics and culture of post-war U.S., as well as those on the history of modern China and the history and culture of Vietnam. She is the author of numerous books, including The Vietnam Wars, 1945 through 1990, for which she won the Berkshire Women's History Prize. Finally, Robert Schenken. Mr. Schenken is a claimed writer of stage, television, and film, and he will be moder moderating this afternoon's discussion. He's the author of 14 original full-length plays and the movie The Quiet American. He has won the Pulitzer Prize, the Tony Award, the Writers Guild Award, and has been, a nominated, has been nominated for two Emmy Awards. Mr. Schenken adopted his own Tony Award-winning play, All the Way, about Lyndon Baines Johnson, and it will debut on the HBO Network next month. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Um, I want to start off by thanking the LBJ Library and Director Mark Updegrove for creating this event, this extraordinary event, which is so much in line with LBJ's vision for the library, um, and a conversation which I hope will be repeated uh, all over this country. I was so moved uh, by yesterday's panels. I know that everybody will have had their individual experience, but my, my takeaway, the thing that, that stuck with me, was a statement uh, by Ms. Galloway, 
her very trenchant injunction to us all, hate the war, love the warrior. Hate the war, love the warrior. Um, with that in mind, it is uh, absolutely appropriate before we begin to acknowledge those veterans who are in our, in our audience today, whether they served in Vietnam or any subsequent conflict. To you men and women, we thank you for your service to our country. And I also want to add to those individuals in the audience who participated in the anti-war peace movement, who by exercising their conscious, conscious constitutional rights, we thank you for your service to the country. Hate the war, love the warrior. I'm so pleased that the panelists we have here, people who represent a wide range of experience and politics, but who have all thought very deeply and passionately about these issues. The title of our panel, of course, is How the War Divided a Nation and Shaped an American Culture. Well, fortunately, we have 50 minutes, so we'll just whip that out <laughs> and then get on to Iraq and settle the national debt. Um, <laughs> You know, when I think about Vietnam, it seems to me that it created for everyone an almost unendurable moral conflict. Presidents, privates, citizens, all. We are not here today to refight old battles, uh, no matter how tempting that might be. And while I don't expect to be turning any swords into plowshares up here, what I think we all hope is that for a moment, we will get beneath the rhetoric and really talk and engage in a muscular way with our history. And in doing so, come to a more complete and honest understanding of ourselves and of our nation. I truly believe that healing, real healing, only begins with such conversations. Our discussion will fall into two parts. The first will be about the anti-war peace movement and the second on its larger effect on the American culture. And I'm going to start with Marilyn here. Um, I, I'm going to ask you to give us a little bit of context because it seems to me, and I am not a historian, let me say that right at the top, um, that there is a fairly muscular history uh, in America of civil disobedience in regard to foreign wars. I think of Henry Thoreau in jail uh, protesting the Mexican-American War or the uh, draft riots in New York City in, uh, during the Civil War. Maybe you would just give us a little context about the anti-war peace movement, which I'll here and after refer to as the movement, and save us a little bit of time. Okay, if you don't mind, people, I don't know how many of you were here last night, but I just want to correct something that Henry Kissinger said, because I think it's really important. Kissinger said that there had been no carpet bombing in Cambodia, that the United States had bombed along a narrow five-mile strip and um, had succeeded in its goal and reduced American casualties. So I looked it up, because I knew that was wrong, but I wanted to get it exact. The United States dropped 2,756,941 tons of ordnance on Cambodia in 230,516 sorties on 113,716 sites. So just to, for the sake of historical accuracy. Um, now, some in the audience may feel that that was perfectly justifiable but it wasn't a five-mile bombing strip. Um, you asked about civil disobedience. Civil disobedience, and indeed many of the tactics employed by the civil rights movement and then by the anti-war movement, begins with uh, the labor movement, really. I think civil disobedience, certainly in terms of uh, the Mexican-American War and several other conflicts, but uh, the tactics developed in the, by the labor movement, sit-ins, um, when you took over a factory and just sat in it um, and uh, as a part of a protest. Uh, strikes, uh, moratoria of various kinds. The knowledge of that didn't disappear, but it all went sort of underground in the 50s when McCarthy so, or McCarthyism, so dominated American politics that protest was really very, very difficult. All protesters were labeled communists, many were jailed. Protests during the Korean War, for example, one of the most unpopular wars the United States has fought, uh, was barely visible. 
It was in polls, but now out on the streets. So what I think happened is that the civil rights movement ignited really a mass movement in this country, north and south. Uh, and what started to happen is that a growing number of Americans realized that the country they thought they lived in, peaceful, just, honorable, didn't exist in terms of African American population and maybe never had. There was a kind of uneasy recognition uh, of the way in which the patriotic meta-narrative that we all learned in school was inaccurate at the very least. The civil rights movement and what it brought to the front in terms of understanding and rewriting the history of the United States, the tactics, the bravery, the courage, all of that fed into very directly in terms of personnel, for one thing, Tom, I know, myself, <laughs> into the anti-war movement. Uh, and by 1963, beginning in 1963 and then building steadily as the war itself built, the anti-war movement sort of took over. Yes, that's a, a, you know, the, I'm so pleased that you, you brought us to the civil rights movement. And, and Tom, I don't know, everyone knows Tom, of course, as a, one of the leading voices of the anti-war movement. They may not be aware of his service um, in terms of civil rights. Tom was a freedom writer one of those extraordinary individuals who uh, put their bodies on the line in challenging Jim Crow and, uh, and was beaten for it. And I wonder, Tom, if you could just, for a few minutes, just talk about the, this more precise connection between civil, the civil rights movement and the anti-war peace movement. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you for your welcome. I, I was a student editor at the University of Michigan and used to uh, visit uh, Austin to uh, meet with people like Ronnie Duggar and Rob Burledge and uh, my first wife, uh, Sandra Kaysen. They were all involved in the um, anti-war movement uh, after they were involved in the civil rights, civil rights. movement. Um, I was conscripted to be a freedom rider uh, uh, at a bus terminal in uh, um, Albany, Georgia, and I was told... Uh, uh, th that I should be beaten up and, and not um, uh, fight back. And my wife was told to stay away at a distance so that she could take scrupul scrupulous notes for the YWCA, which employed her. The YWCA. Correct. <laughs> um, and uh, it was a time when uh, Vietnam was a very distant object uh, uh, in, in my sight. Um, we were more uh, devastated by the, the Cuban Missile Crisis that had occurred when we were very young and traumatized uh, so many people. But it was the Civil Rights Movement, it was the, uh, the young people uh, from black communities in the South who first opposed the war, who first opposed the draft. They were being uh, drafted in the largest numbers and sent directly to the battlefield in a disproportionate uh, number as well. And um, this is 1960, 61, 62, mind you. It's not 68. Yes, And, uh -huh. and uh, <clears throat> I think people like uh, um, uh, Cassius Clay became Malcolm, uh, Malcolm X. X in people's minds. It was all one big black resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, Muhammad Ali was one of the ones that uh, refused the uh, conscription on, on um, religious grounds. Uh, but it was mainly um, um, a, a black movement that was rising among young people at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I became a freedom writer and a civil rights activist, and I was living in Atlanta, and uh, Vietnam was still some distance in my mind, although we quickly knew that 17,000 advisors were there. We immediately knew that the draft was coming, uh, I went down to see my draft board and went to uh, New York to an induction terminal and, and uh, I'll never forget, it was like a hundred naked 17-year-olds in the same place, <laughs> kind of shivering. And um, I was assigned uh, one why, and they said, why one why? Why one why? What, what do you mean? And 
They said, if the communists hit the beach, you're going to be called up. So, so I was in Wait, a, which beach? The San Diego beach, oh. of course. <laughs> <laughs> not, not Da Nang. Uh, I, I would be called up in case the war came home. It is so, it is so interesting, this, this ironic uh, juxtaposition of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement in Vietnam, uh, particularly here, because President Johnson, of course, was a huge supporter of civil rights and did so much for civil rights, and yet would find himself in opposition to a whole movement that had grown out of civil rights, and indeed the civil rights movement right. will, will shortly take a sharp turn away, and we're going to touch on that a little bit later. But I, I want to bring David into the conversation here, if I may. Um, you know, one of the things that is often talked about is the generation gap. Um, that is, uh, this, this idea that there was an older generation, the, the greatest generation, um, and, and their children or grandchildren who then became the countercultural revolution, um, that there was some substantial difference um, in character or class or attitude or, or something. And David's book, um, which if you haven't read, I, I, I can't recommend enough, They Marched Into Sunlight, um, talks about this in such a beautiful and compassionate way. And I, and I wonder if you would say a few words about, about that book and, and what you did with that, because I think it, it, really, it really speaks to kind of what we're trying to get at here. I come at it a few years later than, than Tom. Uh, the book takes place in 1967. Uh, but it's, be, it's when everything is still up in the air. It's before the Tet Offensive. It's before Walter Cronkite saying that Vietnam is a stalemate. So nobody knows, and it's before people know where the, the anti-war movement is going to end up. Um, so is there, there's that energy of, of not knowing at that point what's going to happen <clears throat> next. Um, the generation gap in 1967 was not what it would become in 68, 69, 70. Um, when, when I arrived at the University of Wisconsin campus in the fall of 1967, uh, the largest um, membership group on campus was the Young Republicans. <laughs> Um, there was a panty raid that got more <laughs> coverage than the war. Um, that, war memories that don't. fall. Um, so, but I was one of millions of kids from the post-war baby boom generation who were just coming of age then. <clears throat> and it seemed like every week was a year, that there was so much transformation and change yeah. through every week of that period starting for me in the fall of 67. Um, and so the event that, the two events that my book hinges on, one is a protest at the University of Wisconsin against Dow Chemical Company, the makers of Agent Orange and Napalm. The other was a battle in Vietnam um, during the period when uh, General Westmoreland was asking President Johnson for more and more troops. If we just had enough troops like U.S. Grant in the Civil War and went out and found the enemy, held them in place and killed them, we would win the war. Uh, these two events are going on at the same time um, in the book. But, um, but both of these involve a, a beginning of it, what would become the generation gap because of what my generation saw as either deception mm -hmm. or um, falsification or uh, a, a belief that they were inculcated in during their younger years of America's greatness, which seemed to f fly in the face of what we were facing at that point. Um, but in 67, uh, it was just be really in some sense, although the civil rights movement had been going on for a long time, uh, the, the mass movement, you had, you had many people like Tom, uh, maybe 300 or 400 at the University of Wisconsin who actually knew what was going on in Vietnam and were studying it and could talk about it in a very intelligent, deeper historical way. And then you had thousands of kids who were just starting to learn about it at that point. You know, it's, a, again, the, the, there's the irony here, um, the protest against Dow uh, at the University of Wisconsin and the charges uh, laid against those uh, students as being unpatriotic. And, and of course, as we now know, uh, Agent Orange has gone on to, to be one of the worst um, killers of those brave men and women one who of served the, one of in, the, in the, Vietnam. One of the connections and, and ironies, you might say, of, of the two very different, it seems like they're completely different worlds, the anti-war and, and what was going on in Vietnam, but yeah. they're about the same thing. But one of the, the connections, um, which is both tragic and meaningful, 
is that here were these students protesting against Agent Orange and Napalm, um, holding a civil disobedient sit-in at the Commerce Building. <clears throat> and so many of the soldiers who survived the battle that I wrote about um, over the last 10 years have been dying of different bladder cancers, uh, one after another, all attributed to that year they spent in Vietnam in an area that was just uh, overloaded with, with Agent Orange. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in taking a moment here um, to talk about why there was such passionate resistance to the war um, and to examine um, what I'm going to call four wellsprings of this. We're, gonna, we're not going to get it too deep in the weeds here, but it is important. It is important to get the history right. And, and all too often I feel that we, we kind of skate past things. We, we, we sort of jump over. So we're going to touch on four issues here, and I'm going to ask our panelists to respond to them. The first one, and all of these sort of fall under the heading of why are we here? Um, and, and you saw at this uh, lovely... Uh, video, this beautiful video that's put together, the tape of President Johnson explaining, yet again, why we are here. And so the first of that is this, we made a promise. Promises were made. And, and, and yet it seems to me that the United States made a lot of promises to a number of different people at different times, and there is a certain selectivity about which promises we honored and which ones we didn't. So I would like to just talk about that and focus it very narrowly on the United States' early relationship with Ho Chi Minh at the end of World War II. Uh, we did have a relationship with Ho Chi Minh. So if I could just toss that out and we, to the panel. Sure. Maybe Marilyn, you would like to speak to this? Sure. Um, can, can I just say one thing about the generation gap? And that is that the, one of the earliest protests was a full page ad in the New York Times on the part of prominent uh, ministers um, Fosdick, Niebuhr, I can't remember the others. That was 63. So there was a whole grown-up peace movement. Yes, yes. Sure. And maybe one has to distinguish between the peace movement and an anti-war movement. They're certainly connected, but there might, might be interesting uh, differences as well. As far as the United States and Ho Chi Minh, um, Ho Chi Minh had set up in the um, um, mountainous region of northern Vietnam, um, a uh, station for opposing the Japanese and for broadcasting to the, uh, the American Air Force the location of Japanese troops and so on. So there was this relationship very early. Well, it starts in the mid-40s. Uh, so we, they, were, they were collaborating. We were working together, yeah, fighting the Japanese. In fact, Ho Chi Minh was given a name, Agent... Uh, I forget, the, I think it was Agent 09. So, well, I know it wasn't 07, but it was Agent 09. So, like that. so, and the other thing that Ho did was to, there had been a downed pilot in that area, and Ho Chi Minh and some of the other members of the Viet Minh, which was the uh, um, umbrella resistance to the Japanese and then later the resistance to the French, it was certainly um, led by communists like Ho Chi Minh, but it was also non-communists who were against the Japanese and against the French. So it was a broad-based um, organization. Anyhow, Ho led this pilot back a, a couple of hundred miles to um, where there was an American air base, Kunming, in China. And there he met uh, General Chenault. And he asked Chenault for a picture of himself. Chenault loved to give out pictures of himself. <clears throat> and he asked him also for some Colt pistols, which were very popular because Westerns were very popular in Vietnam. So Chenault wrote to Ho, spelt as I remember, H-O-O, -O, and also gave him several pistols, which Ho brought back and distributed to each of the collaborating groups, non-communist groups, who were in the Viet Minh at the time. <clears throat> At some point, the uh, United States uh, parachuted in something called the Deer Team, which I believe Robert met them in their later years. Through, through an odd set of circumstances, I traveled through Vietnam with members of the Deer Team for another day, but yes. And they trained Ho and Jop and the beginnings of a, of a military movement that would act against the Japanese and then against the French. Um, when the war ended, 
in 45. Ho Chi Minh um, and the Viet Minh and troops trained by the Americans, but under the leadership of Giap, um, moved to Hanoi and declared Vietnamese independence. Present was Archimedes Patty and a number of other members of the Deer team. Um, in fact, Ho asked Patty for help in translating the Declaration of Independence. Um, he had some difficulty with some words. He wanted to get it right. Which he included in his... In the Vietnamese Declaration of Independence. In the Vietnamese Declaration of Independence. Ho also wrote to Truman several letters saying, we want your help. We need help in developing economically. We have been under French colonialism since the 1870s, a very retrograde form of colonialism. We need help in economics. We need help in education. Help us and we will open to you trade, investment, whatever. Truman never answered the letters. Later, people claimed he never got them. Um, most historians believe he did get them and just didn't answer them. And so Ho was just shut off from any possibility of American aid at that point. But the relationship begins in the mid-40s. Right, right. And uh, the French, of course, come back. The, the decisions are made by the Allied powers that the French will have their colonies back and thus begins the French Indochina War. Robert, if I could add just one Absolutely. tiny little memento to that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a soldier in, that I wrote about named Clark Welch, who was a company commander in Vietnam in the battle that, and survived the battle. And he carried a Tommy gun that he had gotten from a Viet, Viet Cong soldier in an earlier battle. And that was one of the deer team's <laughs> Tommy guns going all the way back, showing that connection, that odd connection of over the decades. Uh, at, at the end of the French Indochinese War, uh, an agreement is, is made. Uh, a reluctant Ho uh, accepts a partition, a temporary partition of Vietnam with the clear understanding, it's written, that there will be an election, a free election in 10 years to determine this. Um, he's criticized... Uh, no, the election was to be in two years. Two years, two years. Ho wanted it in six months. His yeah. compromise was two years. His compromise was two years. Um, he was criticized at the time for... for compromising. For compromising. But you have to understand the Chinese had several divisions which had entered northern Vietnam. Um, and uh, Vietnam's historical enemy with China, which goes back thousands of years, Ho famously said, I would rather smell French shit for the next 60 years than eat Chinese shit for the next thousand years. He had a way with words. <laughs> he had a way with words. <laughs> and, it, and indeed, and indeed um, you know, uh, the, there was no election. The promised election was not held. Um, and uh, America, uh, the French Indo Chinese War results. The French are, be, are driven out in less than 60 years, and America enters. So let's just, so just set that aside for a second. Yes, Tom. Um, <clears throat> I thought this panel was about the anti war movement. Um, we, we only have a few minutes, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think it's worth rehashing the history that we already know about the 1940s. Um, Not everybody. But the, to go back to the point of the, the panel, uh, with all due respect, the um, anti-war movement partly started in France among people who were, uh, you know, against the Vietnam War and against the uh, Algerian War. But when it started here, um, to go to David's point, um, the leadership quite quickly became veterans of the war. The leadership of the American anti-war movement was veterans. Uh, they were disabled veterans in hospitals, or they were people who had actually killed communists and been wounded and came back to be attacked by their countrymen here, as in the case of uh, John Kerry being swift-boated. Uh, th there were others who were very instrumental, like John McCain. Uh, and McCain and Kerry, uh, for all their differences, uh, were able to get the administration uh, to diplomatically recognize uh, Vietnam and end what could have been another Cold War disaster. And 
uh, I came into this only because um, I met a, a, a veteran in, in uh, Venice, California named Ron Kovic, who later became an, a storyteller and central figure in a, in a movie. Um, and uh, he was... Uh, Born on the 4th of July. He was fully disabled. <clears throat> and I was teaching a class uh, at a Catholic college in Los Angeles, and I invited him to come and speak. And he had the students just wrapped. Um, he had that hippie look, uh, the classic uh, veterans look. And, and one thing he said was unforgettable. Could only have been said by a vet. Um, I lost my body, but thank God I saved my mind. So we have to understand the role of veterans, uh, as well as clergy, as well as students, as well as the Chicano Moratorium, as well it was as... Not a, it was not a monolithic movement. It was, it was comprised of many, many different groups, not just a student-led group by any means. But it had one very thing very much in common, I think, was uh, <clears throat> since we couldn't vote, of course, um, that should not be forgotten, we could be drafted, but we couldn't vote on the politicians who were drafting us. There were very few channels of protest. There was the, uh, the nonviolent uh, movement, the teach-in movement on college campuses and so on. But the, um, it was kind of like uh, the Reconstruction after the Civil War in which um, uh, the Civil War ended because slaves walked away and became allied with the Union Army. In this case, um, students walked away, veterans walked away, um, um, intellectuals walked away, uh, draftees walked away, uh, until one Marine historian, uh, I remember, uh, late in the war, about 69, when it really turned terrible and ugly and awful, uh, said in a report that the, um, the war was going to end because the army was on the verge of collapse. But it wasn't simply the army. It was the, the campuses were all closed. After Nixon invaded Cambodia, there were more student strikes than any time in history, as and far as I one know. One and a half million students participated in that There's strike. a numbers uh, debate. I think that future conferences need to study this because it's a mystery about why this anti-war happened. I think it was a moral insult, and there were concrete grievances, of course, like being drafted or being ordered around by a, a commander, uh, whatever it was. But the, the political order disintegrated. You had peace cam candidates for president, for Senate, Republicans, Democrats. Everything was a withdrawal because that was the only option, and the country kind of recognized that things were coming to an end. Well, I think there was this real um, sense, if I may jump in here, because I want to hear, hear from David uh, again. I want to bring this around. Um, the, the rhetoric of, of the government ab about the war simply was at complete odds with the facts on the ground, or the facts as people understood them. Um, you wrote about this in your book, David, and there's some really kind of extraordinary examples. I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing one or two of them. Well, this is the credibility gap that the soldiers endured, yeah. um, where the soldiers in the battle that I write about um, walked into an ambush, uh, 140 soldiers, uh, 100, 1,200 Viet Cong waiting for them in the, in the trees and in bunkers set up. And because of the timing of this battle, right when Westmoreland wanted more troops and believed that made, making the argument that it could win the war because of that, um, the government, the military lied about what happened in the battle. They declared it a victory. They, they uh, made up a body count. And I found um, the military historian who came to the site of the battle a few days later, interviewed all of the soldiers, because two famous people had been killed in the battle. One was an all-American football player named Donald Hollider, who was a major, and the other was uh, 
Lieutenant Colonel Terry Allen, the son of a famous World War II General Terry Allen, and two of uh, Terry Allen's daughters are actually in the audience here today, um, uh, and suffering all of these decades because of that war. Uh, but in any case, the, the oral historian came and interviewed the survivors and said, how many Viet Cong did you see? One would say 10, another would say 11, one would say 12, 10, 11. Those, that, that was how many were killed, but they added them all up and said it was 140. <laughs> um, and then uh, General Westmoreland came to the EVAC hospital a few days later and met with some of the survivors and said to one, Sergeant Barrow, um, well, what, what, what happened? And, and uh, Sergeant Barrow said, we were ambushed. And Westmoreland said, no, you weren't ambushed. They couldn't acknowledge that it was an ambush. Um, and that, that lie bothered the soldiers more than anything else. It, it denied them of their, of their integrity. They knew what happened in the battle and the government lied about it. And so whatever the politics of those soldiers were, which ranged from anti-war to strongly supporting the war, they all were angry at the government for fabricating uh, the reality of what happened to them that day. Yeah. It's, it's easy to understand how, how the anti-war uh, resistance spread with situations like this, experiences like this over and over again, um, particularly for our veterans community. There's no question that the, that the anti-war peace movement um, accomplished great things. It did bring the war to an end, and there are two presidents who stepped down uh, as a direct consequence of it. And yet, as in, as in all things, you know, there are opportunities missed, there are regrets. Um, I, I was so moved, Tom, by a, a statement of yours that, uh, that you've published online and that I uh, believe you've asked the uh, uh, LBJ Library to post on their website. Um, and uh, it's both, you say, you say something in there that startled me. Um, uh, courage is something that one often associates with you, but there's, a, there's a, an aspect of humility here that, that I had, was quite moving. And I'd like to quote you and ask you if you wouldn't mind to expand just a little bit on this. You said, and I'm reading from your post, um, I personally regret my own part in many decisions that the peace movement made. Um, I, I find that it's just such a powerful and moving um, statement. And I, and I wonder if you would explain what that, what that refers to or what that means for you. Well, th we all suffered uh, PTSD. We were all veterans uh, in a sense of a common uh, tragedy. Uh, we were all led uh, by high officials that deceived us and divided us. Um, there's no comparison in my mind between the uh, suffering that our troops had inflicted on them by these policies and the relatively uh, minor casualties that the anti-war suffered. There were eight suicides, 28 people were shot by uh, our own troops. Um, but there's no comparison there. The, the, the commonality is that you can't go through a life, you can't go through a war um, without regretting something. And I, I was just reacting to the fact that there are so many people who, who say, you know, they're proud of everything they did, whatever it was that they did. And mm -hmm. I find um, in my many years in the legislature meeting with uh, veterans, um, that they, uh, some of them were very hard line. They wanted me expelled from the legislature, of course, and I couldn't agree with, with that uh, suggestion. But, but typically, um, after a couple of hours of discussion, uh, the stereotypes kind of went, went back, and I found myself almost telling war stories. Um, uh, Do you mean about the anti war movement? We're all veterans of something, and I've talked, I've talked to Chicago police about what they did to me and what I allegedly did to them. Uh, speaking of Chicago 1968, the important point here is that at the height of those riots and the police coming in and the, the <coughs> soldiers from Vietnam were being sent mm -hmm. uh, in uh, uh, 
what were called daily dozers with concertina wire on the front of the jeeps to attack us with machine guns in the streets because they had been told by the uh, FBI that Abby Hoffman was going to spread LSD into the waters of Lake Michigan and the black, the black community in South uh, Chicago was going to rise up as guerrillas and take over the city during the convention. Um, but the important story is that the night before this reached its climax, troops were called up from Fort Hood to come uh, to Chicago and to suppress us. And there was a big meeting at Fort Hood, 100, 200, 300 soldiers, and they refused orders to go to Chicago. And they were told, um, you will be uh, uh, disciplined and, and uh, treated harshly if you don't go to Chicago. So they spent all night talking to their commanding officers about they're not going to Chicago. And they worked out a, 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 a compromise the, the commanders agreed that there would be no live in ammunition <laughs> as long as they made the appearance of going to Chicago. Uh, and again, the interaction between the veterans and the, the, the people who were veteran activists couldn't have been more That's very compelling. Yes, well, the, the irony and the complexity uh, is very rich. But we're, you we're, have we're, to start we're, by admitting you're, you're what you feel, feel guilty or badly about, and your former opponent uh, has to listen very carefully and has to explain their side of it because there's two sides to everything. This is, this is the conversation that and I hope continues you, nationally you, that we're starting here today. I then think this you is begin a very to forgive time. and heal. Yes, Only forgive and heal. Yes. Um, we're we running out of time here, and um, uh, I'm, <laughs> it's gone very quickly. I would like to take just a... Uh, a little bit of what we have left to discuss the effect of the anti-war peace movement on American culture. And, and I'd like to start with race, um, since uh, we're all pretty much acknowledging the importance of civil rights and how that influenced uh, this movement. How did the uh, Vietnam War impact race and race relations in the United States? Um, I'd really like to, to open this up. David, do you, uh, you want to start us off or? Um... Well, uh, it's a very, there's a lot of contradictory things going on there. I mean, on the one hand, one could argue that the military is the best integrated institution in American right. life. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, certainly from, World, from after World War II when the, when the military did start to desegregate through Vietnam and, and into the present, um, the military has actually been an important factor in, 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 in the rise of, of, of an African-American middle class in America because of, because of its uh, meritocracy uh, in some sense. Um, in, in other ways, a lot of, of African-American soldiers came back from Vietnam just as they had from World War II, um, feeling that they'd, they'd fought for a country that was, uh, you know, the whole Cold War concept was America is the beacon of liberty and freedom in the world, and yet these were second-class citizens in their own country. So that, that brought the movement after World War II of, of, of blacks, and <coughs> certainly after Vietnam, it intensified even more, even as the black power movement was going through the, all the 60s. Coming home, a lot of these uh, African-American veterans felt even more intensely uh, disenfranchised from their country. Yes, the, the, the moment that, what I think of as the tipping point in Greeley, Mississippi, uh, where Stokely Carmichael, will, uh, who has been arrested yet again that morning and then released and just in time to make the nighttime rally. This is on the Meredith March. And um, he's uh, beside himself with frustration and rage, uh, outrage, and, um, and he will eventually lead the crowd in chants of black power. It's a sort of tipping moment in the movement. But he leads up to this. He talks about a sign, a handwritten sign he saw held uh, by uh, a young black man on the road that day, which said, no Viet Cong ever called me nigger. And uh, this really cuts to the heart of this painful um, problem that uh, uh, African-American soldiers and, and, and indeed uh, minorities of all uh, races felt uh, 
being sent abroad to, to fight on behalf of freedom and liberty and returning to a country in, in which uh, they had only just recently, in some cases, gotten the right to vote. Um, well, King's speech in 67 at Riverside Church yes, yes. Uh -huh. really sums Talk it up. Talk about that. Uh, it's an extraordinary speech in which he brings together the movements uh, of um, for civil liberties and civil rights and anti-war. And he says, it's, it's a long and, and extraordinary speech. It's online. I urge you all to read it. It's probably one of the great speeches of the last century, at least. And he said at one point that this was a time when there were what were called ghetto riots, or you can call them uprisings, uh, but certainly rebellions in many, many cities across the country. <coughs> and King said that he could not raise his voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first raised my voice against the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. And that was the United States. And the speech, I, I, thought, I think it had a tremendous impact uh, on both parts of both movements. I want to say something else, and I don't know if my co-panelists will agree or how many of you will agree, but the anti-war movement and the 60s as such are always named as the moment of the greatest division in American history since the Civil War, um, which, by the way, was the last war fought on American soil. But it seems to me that division and debate is essential in a democracy. And you get unity and unification in fascist countries, not in democratic ones. Division is about disagreement. It's about arguing. It's about what Tom was saying about listening. I don't know about healing. Some things maybe can't ever heal. That's a possibility. But you can open the wound and examine it. In fact, if you don't open a wound and clean it, it will never heal. Just skin grows over and it's poisonous forever. So I just want to say a word in favor of, of reasonable divisions uh, about the policy and the course that America should take in the world. Democracy is a messy business. One hopes. Yeah, one hopes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Ex exactly. Well said. Um, that, uh, that speech of Dr. King. Um, I'd like to, uh, um, uh, Dr. King's, uh, that is a turning point in the movement. It's a turning point in the Johnson administration and his uh, relationship to Dr. King, sadly, um, because uh, the president views um, King's very clarion call for resistance. Um, as, it's an amazing uh, moment in your play. Before. As disloyal. Um, and it's, a, it's, again, it's another tragic moment in a history full of tragic moments and opportunities lost. Um, how did the Vietnam uh, War and the, uh, uh, the conflict about it affect the United States in terms of class or our awareness of class or class divisions? You know, this, we talk about, um, you know, in one modest example, the draft and the unfairness of the draft which targeted uh, initially, anyway, uh, minorities, but it also targeted um, white students too, or white individuals uh, who were poor. It, it would predominantly focus. So there was a real class focus there that, that doesn't get talked about. So I would like to just suggest, you know, because I think there was significant movement in this regard in terms of our awareness of what well, we think of ourselves as a very egalitarian society, but how true is that? And, uh, well, I don't think the draft is a modest part of it at all. I think it's a very important part of it. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the contradictions, the hypocrisy was there in the draft in terms of who could get out and why and not fight. Um, and I think that, that throughout the course of, of American wars, you've seen a uh, class played out in different ways, largely the uh, working class fighting the wars. Um, that that the uh, upper middle class or, or or the government is is the policymakers are coming from a different class with with some exceptions John Kerry speaking tonight being one Bob Kerry tomorrow okay. um, and and Senator Rob another uh, but in a large degree I think that that tension is has always been there and um, I think that that it it it's both uh, in many ways it's a negative and and the largest being that so much of 
the nation at any point is not affected by the policy and the war and can go on with its life without really dealing with it because it's just the working class fighting. I think it is. It, the, it is um, sorry, go ahead, Tom. The, I, I, I was, my dad was a Marine, and I was uh, raised on a Marine base in San Diego, and uh, my assignment at age five was to walk the coast and look for Japanese zeros that were going <laughs> to attack, and uh, so I was part of the civil defense. And you did a good job. <laughs> yeah, actually... Uh, Fairly well, but uh, I was only five. The, um, the, I did it on my the favorite book was the um, German planes. But let history good. show there were no zero attacks on the West Coast during Tom's watch. Close. <laughs> my my favorite book uh, uh, as I grew older was uh, From Here to Eternity by Jones, and that that was the 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 story of the grunt. My dad was a grunt. He wasn't sent into combat. Uh, my uncle was a grunt. He was sent into combat and was killed by his own friendly fire, was killed by his own machine gun. Um, but the story of the grunt is the story of BVAW, the story of the class differences within our own military between poor, working class, all the way up to the uh, officer corps. Um, uh, in the larger society, you had the same, absolutely the same differences. I don't think I need to spell them out, but I just wanted to draw attention to the, to the, the role of the grunt. As, at least that's what we called them in 1944. I, I think it is. I think it is significant that that Dr. King will eventually move after the the speech, uh, the, the, the sentimental speech at Riverside, within a space of a few years to broadening his mandate to, um, to poor people's march. Poor people's mm -hmm. march. Right. Exactly. No longer race-based, but class right. conscious. Exactly. And, and I very honestly have always thought, and that's when he dies. Yes, that's interesting. Right. I mean, um, I want to talk first for a minute about another significant um, consequence of the war uh, on American culture, and that's the relationship between citizens and their government. You know, we, I, th I think we have a very different relationship now, um, or certainly before, pre-Vietnam and post-Vietnam, and we could just talk a little bit uh, about that. Well, I mean, citizens learn that they have to check up on the government, that they have to, they rely on journalists. When journalists are great, they are truly great. <laughs> and if you read them closely, then you can find out what's going on. Um, and when you find out what's going on, you find out, you realize that the government does not always have your best interests at heart, nor the best interest of many other Americans, and you begin to question. Um, the slogan used to be, well, it was a very rude word I won't use, but it was question authority was the polite way to put it. I think the <laughs> questioning authority is, is essential, not just in a political system, but to growing up, uh, to being a, f a full citizen. You question authority. Doesn't mean you always have to combat it. Sometimes you're in agreement but you need to question. And that need to question, that came up, I think it comes up in the civil rights movement initially, and then it multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. I, you know, I don't know that I'd call it PTSD, but for 10 years, I woke up every morning in a state of rage at my government, because I could see what it was doing and what it was making its military do. <clears throat> um, that wasn't an unimportant part of my um, my teaching, my professional life, and my moral life. And I, I want to say, too, that the anti-war movement, with many veterans, although many did not, but with veterans, Vietnam veterans against the war, formed a kind of community, a shared culture of music, music for sure. You, you listen to the same music, you, uh, even though you weren't in Colorado, you smoked the same dope, uh, and you, you, went on, you went on the same marches. Um, culminating in 1971 with the, the, the huge march uh, against the, the vets. war. The vets leading it uh, and right. preceding it in Dewey Canyon right. 3. Yeah, of vets and then of the rest of the anti-war movement not very long thereafter. Right. And, and John Kerry's great speech to Congress, which I, I hope he quotes this evening. And if he doesn't, I have a copy. <laughs> 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 you know, there are... Um, um, 
We have just a few minutes left here. Um, I'd like to, to bring this up to the current moment. Um, there are social movements uh, now, uh, many of them began uh, as student movements. Um, I'm thinking specifically of Occupy Wall Street or hashtag Black Lives Matter. Um, how do these movements today, um, what debt do they owe to uh, the anti-war peace movement or, or don't? Or in what ways do they echo one another? What might they learn uh, from the experiences, uh, from the regrets uh, uh, that we have? Um, I'd just love to, to touch on that if we might. David? It's hard for me to say how, what the, the younger people in these movements today, what they know about history in the past. Um, so I, I don't want to... True that. I, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, that a lot of, a lot of it has to do with uh, the disparities in, in income and race that are still evident from the time that, of the earlier movements, but I'm not sure that, that all the people who are in these movements today are connecting to that. I think they're, they're more motivated by what they see in front of them. The one similarity I would say is that that um, just as people in the anti-war movement of the 60s saw a disparity between what the government was saying and what the promise of America was versus the reality, so too are people in the Black Lives Movement seeing that same disparity between this notion of a post-racial America versus what they're seeing in the reality of how um, young black men are being treated by the police in the United States. Um, so I think I think there are parallels, but I'm not sure that they see the, 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 the sino of connection. Very the interesting. Theory. Marilyn, what do, you, what do you think? No, I agree, I agree very much with what David said. Um, the, the, one of the big differences is the different social media makes. Mm -hmm. And this is a, actually, I think, on the negative side. That is, we used to meet, endless meetings, endless, endless, endless meetings. <laughs> uh, and you had to stay because if you didn't, you knew that somebody crazy might lead. <laughs> she just happened to go that way. She, she stayed. No, no, no. I mean, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Although I didn't go to Chicago, but um, it was a decision. But um, so with social media, it's not visible. You don't really argue face to face. Crowds can be gathered. You can have uh, flash protests, which are useful. I'm not against them. But there's a, there, there are, because they're flash, they're also a flash in the pan. There's no staying power. Mm. With Occupy, they couldn't figure out a clean set of demands that could actually be responded to. Mm -hmm. So it was a sort of you know kitchen sink collection of things that every not every. I mean, some of the things I didn't agree with, some I did, but there were too many, and there was no uh -huh. way to really follow up on them. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. I, I think this will change. I think it's bound to change. And Tom, I don't know, what do you think? Uh, well, just as the, uh, the early civil rights movement and the early feminist movement uh, and the early anti-war movement shaped uh, young Hillary Clinton, the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement has made it possible uh, for uh, Bernie Sanders. So. You don't know the right, outside-inside effect, but, but Bernie's campaign is absolutely um, a response to the collapse of uh, the Wall Street-dominated certainly, certainly system. Hard, certainly hard to predict where this will go. Right. But this, is, uh, this has been an extraordinary uh, conversation, and I, and I want to thank our panelists, David and Marilyn. Tom, I think you've just done a, a, a tremendous job here. Thank you. You're welcome. For, uh, Thank you, Robert. The conversation. Um, I wish we had time for questions. That's going to happen. Democracy is, democracy is messy. Hate the war, love the warrior. Peace out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>